All right, let's get started, please. Um, <laughs> hello to everyone and thank you for uh, joining us and welcome to what we hope will be a very motivating, provocative and ultimately helpful session. And thank you for sharing your time with us on what is, I think it's safe to say, a momentous day here in the US. So my name is Erica Valenti. I am the regional manager for Emerald Publishing North America. My preferred pronouns are she, her, and hers. It is genuinely my sincere pleasure to moderate this very timely discussion. And our thanks to the Charleston Conference organizers for supporting this panel. And also a very heartfelt special shout out to Susan Spilka for both her passion and her partnership with Emerald on this topic. So we have a lot to get through today in our allocated time. I intend to keep my opening remarks about uh, Emerald's inclusivity report quite top line and brief. And I am going to turn off my camera okay. or try, hold on. There we go. Um, and then work through the slide deck. So before I share with you some headline findings from Emerald's inclusivity report, I think it is important to acknowledge that the survey was completed in March of this year. And this was prior really to the full weight of the global pandemic landing, and certainly before the murder of George Floyd, which sparked a uh, massive outcry in the US that rippled actually around, around the world. So, Due to the gravity of these events, I think that it's logical to conclude that they would have probably had some bearing on the results had the survey been launched post-mark. All of us within the scholarly publishing community, librarians, researchers, publishers, need to do whatever we can from the positions we are in to help drive change for the better for all. Oh, I'm seeing hands raised, hold on. Oh. Can everyone still hear me okay? Okay. Uh, given the way that certain groups have been treated historically, Emerald fully supports new frameworks, programs, practices, and policies that favor inclusivity and diversity. In short, we absolutely have to better the balance. Next. So just a little bit about Emerald. We are an independent family owned global publisher. We publish primarily in the social sciences mm -hmm with a particular publishing intention around um, applied research. We have an established focus as well on mission-based research that supports the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. I believe that we are a very progressive publisher and undoubtedly we are very passionate about diversity and inclusivity from top to bottom at our organization we do recognize the need for a change in research culture. There simply remains a huge imbalance across gender and race, as well as other areas within academic research. And this you know, has fairly deep roots in scholarly culture and to a larger extent history. So to examine and action data on this topic, we commissioned our 2020 Global Inclusivity Report. Now this report in fact sort of comprises two surveys. You can see this at the top. Um, for the academic sector, we sent questionnaires to around 130,000 researchers from a uh, selection from within our global author and editor pool across uh, just over 200 countries worldwide. You can see the respondent metrics at the top left. And again, the purpose of surveying academics was to really get their perspectives on inclusivity in society and the workplace in order to understand their perceptions of barriers. But more importantly, I think, to try and identify potential solutions. 
We also went out to the public, about a thousand members across the United Kingdom and the US. We wanted their perspective on this theme as well, and also to provide comparison with the feedback we received from the academic setting. So the biggest benefit academics saw to more inclusivity in research is promoting different ways of thinking. And you can see some of the other responses here. To the far right, worryingly, 13% uh, of the academic respondents perceived no benefit from inclusivity at all. And there was, I would say, a smattering of comments suggesting that a small minority of the respondents actually felt that inclusivity could lead to mediocrity. Now that final question, that 13%, interestingly, only 4% of the general public surveyed saw no benefits to increase uh, inclusivity. I'd like to highlight as well that roughly 90% of academics ranked inclusivity as important to them personally, but they did not feel it was quite as important to their institution or to academia in general. And about half of respondents to this question only felt um, that it was important to funding bodies. So I, I think it's safe to infer that respondents within the academic sector greatly value inclusivity, but do feel that the environment they work in does not reflect these values. Looking with a global lens, we can see that when we look at the top societal issues across the globe, and we're looking at responses right now from academics, poverty and the divide between those who have and those who have not is perceived as the biggest barrier to an inclusive society. Again, globally, racism does not uh, fall far behind the divide created by poverty. And in North America, Australasia, Northern and Western Europe, and the UK, it is the biggest issue that is felt by academics. Interest, well, not interestingly, interestingly, but we also saw that despite so much work around programming and focus in recent years, gender is still a key barrier to inclusivity across much of the globe, but particularly in North America and Europe. So this was an important piece of this project. We really wanted to gather data around inclusivity change drivers within academia. And we can see from this slide that there are challenges to achieving, sorry, to achieving an inclusive society by 2030 as outlined by the UN's sustainable development goals. The need for more knowledge exchange was cited as the biggest challenge within academia followed by interdisciplinary collaboration and also an overall lack of inclusivity within academic culture. So in terms of what publishers need to focus on, 45% of academics indicated that removing paywalls that limit the number of people who can reach um, access to the research was a key action, but also the need to make to make related research more discoverable beyond academia or the ivory tower. So these are the two sort of key action points that resulted from our survey that publishers can take to help researchers create a more inclusive society. This was also sort of closely followed by roughly 45% agreeing that publishers should open up publication opportunities through increased open access. So all of us, all of our, all of us as stakeholders in our community, we must change our sector to drive for equal representation. I think the, the importance of inclusivity in our society is only going to grow, not diminish over time. And Emerald does not envision an endpoint to our work in this area. Uh, not until both societal and industry frameworks are fundamentally challenged and changed in the right direction. We pledge to continue to be change drivers, and we will also continue to look for support and alliances and partners from our counterpoints in publishing houses, houses as well as within academia. 
but enough from me. Let's move on to our panel speakers, who I'd also like to thank for their time today. First, we will hear from Adriel Hilton, followed by Simone Taylor, and then last but not least, um, Dina Hutto. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing slides and do my best to turn on my camera. Oh yeah, okay, I did it. Um, the tech gods are smiling on me. Um, so please join me in welcoming Adriel Hilton, who is Dean of Students and Diversity Officer at Seton Hill University. Hello, Adriel, nice to see you again. Thank Hello. you for being our lead off hitter. Um, Thanks for having me. You're welcome. And so I guess just to segue over to you, um, I wonder if you can tell us a bit more about your role at Seton Hill and also share with us an overview of Seton Hill's pathway toward uh, DEI actions and focus. Sure. So I'm Adriel Hilton, Dean of Students and Diversity Officer here at Seton Hill University, located an hour outside or 45 minutes outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We're located in the greater Pittsburgh area, Greensburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, we were founded by Elizabeth Ann Seton who founded, of course, Sisters of Charity. So we're a Catholic faith-based institution founded by the Sisters of Charity. Um, been around over 100 plus years. Uh, the university is co-ed, uh, 2,075 or 2,100 students, uh, Division II athletics. Uh, we have roughly out of 2,100 students or 2,075, roughly 19%, particularly minoritized or students of color. Uh, my role as Dean of Students and Diversity Officer is new. I arrived fall 2018 to the role. Uh, the university had two diversity officers, one for faculty and staff, as well as one for students. The diversity officer for faculty and staff recently retired. We now have what is called a presidential task force for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, the co-chairs are the president, uh, who is Dr. Mary Finger, uh, the Vice President General Counsel, which is Mrs. Imogene Counts, uh, Kathy, a uh, faculty member, Dr. David Dropa in social work, and then myself, of course. So it's uh, for our co-chairing this task force where we are working to uh, develop promising or practices in reference to students inside the classroom, students external to the classroom, students within the experiences within the Greensburg community, as well as curricula, how can we diversify our curricula. We're also looking at uh, experiences of faculty and staff, as well as uh, the experiences of faculty and staff within the community at large where we live, Greensboro community. I cannot hear you. That's like my classic move, I'm sorry. Um, I think that was really interesting, thank you. There are a few pieces I think that are uh, particularly interesting. I love the sort of echoes what I talked about in the beginning, which is taking this initiative out to the community, to the real world, moving it beyond you know, an institution. So full applause from me on that. I wonder, are you, could you speak to any important lessons learned, either successes, failures, from your experience of setting up this program over the past two years? Sure. So we wanted to be intentional. Uh, we wanted to have student voices at the table, faculty voices at the table, staff voices at the table. So we wanted to embed or have shared governance where we hear from students, faculty, and staff about their experiences. So we started this journey uh, two years ago where we did focus groups with uh, students of the LGBTQIA community. We did focus groups of students, minoritized students, uh, minority students. Uh, those are non-white students. And we also did focus groups with uh, multicultural international students about their experiences on the hill is what we call it on the hill, Seton Hill. Uh, we're on top of a hill. So uh, so we did focus groups about their experiences on the hill as well as focus groups about their experiences external to the hill. Uh, we've also tried to do focus groups and have uh, been unsuccessful with uh, students with disabilities. Uh, we've had 
uh, three attempts and two, two, two students have showed up. So what we have done now is have created a survey instrument that will be disseminated with for students with disabilities. But from those focus groups and from students lived experiences here on campus, we developed this task force uh, and we have faculty representation, student representation, alumni representation, we also have staff representation. So this task force, which all senior level administrators are um, on the task force will drive the work that we will be doing. That's great. And I think too, you hit on a key point that having a full representation um, breaks down hierarchies, which are for me an absolute necessity when it comes to this very um, important work. What are what about future plans on building the program to make increased um, to keep sort of furthering your efforts? Sure. So every month we have a conversation on race here at the university and that started in June. Uh, so that was an initiative. The president said, hey, we need to develop some type of training and development. So every month we have a conversation on race uh, tied to where we have speakers from around the country. It's called the Freedom Series. Mm -hmm. um, so we've had race and grace talking about uh, discrimination within the church. We've also had uh, the significance of Juneteenth. Uh, mm -hmm. Next month, we're doing um, Native Americans and this month, excuse me, uh, November 12th, we have a session, Native American and mascots, looking at uh, how Washington Redskins is now Washington football. Uh, looking at that and how mascots were used uh, tied to Native American persons. Uh, this month, meaning the month of October that just passed, we had COVID-19 impacts on minoritized communities. Mm -hmm. So we had uh, two medical doctors, uh, as well as uh, disability support services expert, as well as a chemistry faculty member talk about COVID's impact on minoritized communities, LGBTQIA, uh, persons with disabilities, uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color. So every month we're having conversations tied to race uh, through this presidential task force. We also recently had a book lecture, a book club reading for that went university-wide. We have read uh, White Fragility. We have also read White Teachers Teaching in the Hood. And this semester we did uh, how to be an anti-racist by yeah. uh, Ibram Kendi. Uh, so that's so we just had that discussion last week, um, and roughly out of the university, 40, 45 participants to 50 participants were present, and so they each participant gave recommendations on on items that the task force can do to be more inclusive of diversity, equity, inclusion practices here at the university. That sounds exceptional. Um, it really does. I look forward to hearing more about how things are going with you in the future. Thank you so much for, for sharing. Thank um, you. So please let's hear next from Simone Taylor. And if you could turn on your camera, Simone, that would be great. Hello, Simone Taylor is a publisher at AIP Publishing. Um, nice to see you again. Thank you for your time. and. I'd like to start with, I think that you have a very unique perspective, having worked in a government research lab, um, as well as in scholarly publishing at both commercial and society publishing houses. Can you, can you share with us a bit about what's happening at AIP publishing, perhaps at the society at a larger level, and you know, what's happening there to advance inclusivity from, I guess, a publishing perspective first, please. Hello, Erica. Thanks for having me um, at this panel. So, as you rightly point out, AIP Publishing is separate from the institution itself. AIP Publishing is the publishing arm of the American Institute of Physics. The American Institute of Physics has actually done, is actually doing a great deal in diversity planning. It has a strong diversity statement. And if you go to its website, it has a huge, it has a whole section devoted to its current initiatives in diversity and inclusion, which I can't speak to in much detail because I'm part of the publishing unit, but it is um, 
worth pointing out that a lot of it is centered around observing and trying to address the discrepancies that we notice in the physical sciences, right through from education, right through to people working in physics as professionals. And I think this month in physics today, there are, there are a range of interviews from black physicists oh, wow. in the, within, from the organization's perspective where they've interviewed them and asked them to talk about their experiences at work. So if anyone's got time, it'd be worth just spending time looking at those interviews and talking to people. At AIP Publishing, we are literally at the start of our journey in formalizing the structure for addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion. We've just started a committee where we've invited volunteers from the workforce to be part of it. And our goals center around building competency in leading and managing DEI issues but it's just not limited. It's not just limited to the workforce. We're trying to make sure that this also reaches the communities we serve. And we're looking at the whole spectrum of services we provide, how we encourage our journals and our journal editors to be more diverse, mm -hmm. how we look at the papers we publish, make sure we publish from uh, the, the, the products we publish, not just papers, but make sure we embrace authors from a range of geographies and backgrounds and how we try to build that into our own, how we try to adopt those principles into our own work as an organization. Got it. Um, I think that sort of deep introspection um, in terms of not just the subject areas that we publish in, but the actual voices yeah. and is, a, is a really great way to move the needle from changing, I mean, eventually the scholarly canon um, and it's bold work. And we're undertaking some of that at Emerald, of course, as well. Yeah. There are a lot of privacy issues, which are interesting. Yes. Where that's like the, the inverse is we want to gather data and ensure that we're being rigorous and intensive with the voices. But there, there are certainly, you know, well-founded privacy issues as well in terms of submitters and and authors. Yeah. Do you think there is a clear path for scholarly publishers to beyond that work, which is smart, to really close this gap between um, inclusivity policies and experiences of people in the workplace? You and I, when we talked a few weeks ago, we were talking about PhD work for women and in labs. I thought that was really interesting. Do you mind? Yeah, so there is there is a clear path, but it's still um, there are still fundamental barriers that we may not always be aware of. So mm -hmm. if you look at there's a lot of research out there to show that. Um, there aren't that many women to start off with in the physical, in physics. There are, some disciplines are much better than others in attracting women at, at the undergraduate level through to postgraduate level. Physics and engineering lag behind disciplines like biology and chemistry. Oh. But that being said, um, the representation, that seems to follow the representation then in employment situations, so there are fewer women, and the women graduating from these subjects aren't necessarily represented in the same proportions in the professional space. And we find that too in our own industry, that um, in publishing, in scholarly publishing, that there are many more women in the workforce than are represented proportionally in leadership. So, Becoming aware of the data is one thing, but help it's using that data to move the needle, as you say, to use your expression, to change things is something else entirely. And there we seem to hit a brick wall, some sort of inertia that stops us from doing it. But I think trying to set goals and encouraging people to understand 
why we want to do these things, why we want to make things more equitable is a good place to start. I think so, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that perspective. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me here. You bet. And I'm just gonna keep using sports analogies, but now to our clean up hitter. Um, please welcome Dina Hutto. Hello, last but not oh, least. Okay. <laughs> Dina, you are Reed College's library director. So that's correct. Welcome, great to see you again. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be really interesting to hear from you first to uh -huh. tell us about Reed's longstanding history of student activism. I think it's incredibly <laughs> compelling. Um, do you mind? Uh, absolutely. So um, I know many of the people in the Charleston audience are going to be familiar with Reed College. We're a select selective liberal arts college in Portland, Oregon. Uh, we were founded um, a long time ago by West Coast standards in 1911. And um, with, the, with the idea that uh, the college would bring a very traditional kind of education to undergraduates. So we are all undergraduate. Um, and I think it's not unusual for colleges and universities to have um, a protest ethic. I think at Reed, uh, in some ways, it's kind of interesting because we kind of teach them to be protesters in a way, if you think about it that way. Um, we're very academically traditional. And, um, but we, we definitely have had this sort of progressive liberal ethic within the college. And part of what we do through the academics is really teach students how to think and read and discuss what they're learning and stand up for their point of views and within the academics at Reed that um, ultimately prepares the students to defend a senior thesis and all of our students are required to write a thesis and to defend it in front of an orals board. So since we're um, teaching students to think for themselves and stand up and take action, we shouldn't be that surprised if they uh, wind up having some thoughts about how the college is run <laughs> and tell us about it in that way. And I was telling, when, when Erica and I talked a week or so ago, um, I was telling her that a, uh, a moment of activism that has been uh, really relevant for our black students and students of color in the last few years was an incident, an episode in the late 60s, early 70s, where the college brought in a cohort of black students and um, really did not have faculty to support them, particularly as my understanding. I've been at Reed for a long time. I've been there since the 90s, not this long. So this is history to me. Uh, <laughs> you know, they really didn't have um, a curriculum uh, to support them or staff to support them or a faculty that had particularly pre-thought this. They thrust them into this very traditional academic um, education and uh, the students protested and uh, what they wanted was a black studies program and mm -hmm. at that time uh, and they occupied Elliott Hall, which is our administrative building. And we have lots of photographs of this in the archives uh, of you know, students um, having confrontations with administrators and that sort of thing. So that's, that's part of the history of the college. And ultimately um, those protests were unsuccessful. Ultimately the faculty voted on whether to start a black studies program and they voted no. And that, and so that initiative um, sort of just died in its tracks. Uh, so yeah, so that was that was a history that our students more recently, and something I think our audience members might remember, and that I got to live at Reed was the protest that we had from students in 2017, 2018, uh, where the students were protesting the curriculum. I guess once mm -hmm. again, as in the 60s, um, and we had at that time we had had several years really going back to our president Colin Diver, who um, really got us started. On on uh, diversifying intentionally the faculty, the students and the staff. And uh, so at that point we had quite a number of students of color and there were particularly a couple of black student organizers, two black women who um, looked at the curriculum for our freshman survey course, Humanities. Um, the curriculum for that course was developed in the 1940s and had not mm -hmm. changed substantially since then. And so these students came in and said, 
why is this the defining read experience that we read Homer, we read, uh, you know, some very basics that all of us know, Socrates, Plato, Aeschylus, but they also spend a lot of time reading Thucydides, a name I was not able to pronounce before I came to read, you know, some ancient world writers, and they questioned, why is this the defining read experience? Why don't we have, um, you know, why don't we have other authors? Why don't we have women? Why don't we have people of color? Why is, why is this the only curriculum worth studying? And it was a really good question. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that um, in 2017, and, and the where the library comes into the story. So we had students who came to the archives and it just so happened that that fall, uh, we had hired the first black librarian at Reed that I'm aware of, I won't say for all time, but the first one that I'm aware of who was a special collections librarian. And I think that was really important to the students to see, you know, that we had some like that one like that in the library could, could answer that question of why is this what Reed is about? Isn't there a place for black students at Reed? And um, so our, our special collections librarian was able to help them answer that question. And, uh, you know, they, they, they had done marches, they had done sit-ins in the humanities lecture hall, but uh, they were inspired to once again, occupy Elliott Hall. And that was, that was really kind of the culmination of that crisis for the college was the students occupying Elliott Hall in October through December of that year. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You know, I think you, you hit an important point too, is that in learning environments, mm -hmm. and I think cognitive studies support this fully, mm -hmm. that it's important to see yourself. Yeah. Reflected that mm -hmm. it makes learning and development exactly. and um, so much more rich, um, sort of an embodied lived approach is, mm -hmm. is critical. Mm -hmm. It's really exciting. I love all the, the activism. It sounds like Elliot. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, well, you've got the you've got the library perspective mm -hmm. for this panel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how are you supporting or the library all of this progress that has been made? You mentioned right. this foundational 101 course mm -hmm. with Eurocentric. Um, right. There just I feel like there must be a lot of dynamics in play between students. Faculty oh, absolutely. And the administration, mm -hmm. and often at the heart of that sits mm -hmm. the library, the, right. the hub of information. Right. Well, so let me answer that by going ahead and sort of finishing my little parallel story here about what happened. And, uh, you know, what happened was, I think um, what was different by 2017, 2018 was we did have a diverse faculty. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the thing that we didn't have back in the 60s and 70s. So, uh, you know, a black faculty member stood up on the floor of the faculty. I get to be in that room since I'm the college librarian. So that uh, can be exciting. It was in this case and said, the students are right. We need to think about this course. Is this the course that introduces the college to our first year students? And um, that really got the ball rolling. Um, so other things you may have heard about Act There in Academe, we did um, decide to overhaul that course make it something different that would still um, serve the educational aims was mm -hmm. to teach students how to engage with materials, discuss things academically, write about them academically. Um, so we kept those course aims, but we changed the reading list. Uh, I've got a $2 million Mellon Foundation grant to help us do that. Mellon was excited about helping us in that endeavor. And um, it's a much more flexible course now. So now it's a four module course. We still deal with some of the ancient texts. Uh, what we're teaching um, this year, uh, the four modules are ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, and then we go to Mexico City and Harlem. So um, although the, the, you know, the curriculum has changed a little bit over time, but we've never been in 20th century Harlem before in this course, let me put it that way. So of course, you know, it's, it's been an amazing opportunity, I think in many ways for the college as a whole, but especially for the library and um, allowing us to be involved in going back and reassessing the goals of that course and uh, 
how the library can participate in that. It's allowed us to put information literacy in there in many ways. Because mm -hmm. I know, uh, I know Charleston is a collections uh, conference. I'd be remiss if not saying that we had to do a lot of reexamination of our collections, um, and uh, it it took us beyond text. We're doing a lot of streaming video in this course, lots of streaming audio, uh, images. Um, just, it's just, it's just a very, we didn't, you know, we had the resources for ancient Greece and Rome. We didn't have hardly any resources for Mexico and not as much in Harlem Renaissance as we needed. So it's been, um, it's been a um, exciting opportunity for us to step up and support this course in different ways. I love that. It's a real growth opportunity. It is. And I think as humans, we, we look for those. So, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it, it certainly echoes what some of the other speakers had said and what I tried to impart on my opening, which mm -hmm. is the intentionality and commitment has right. to, to be there. Mm -hmm. So this sounds like a foundational course that sets mm -hmm. the tone at your school for basic critical thinking. Mm -hmm. tools and, and getting the minds working that way so I absolutely think, um, yeah kudos and I think to you and to read yeah it speaks to the importance of having um the right people in the room you know I think mm -hmm. read uh you know, has uh, not always been the greatest at uh, planning or intentionally uh, adopting new ways of doing things, new ways of doing things, not really in our DNA always. But um, I think that what we did do that was right was um, become a more inclusive place over a long period of time, really put a lot of effort into it. And having um, different voices in the room has really made all the difference when this challenge came to us. Understood. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, Thank it was you. Great to hear from from you. Um, let's look at time. It is two zero six. So, what I think we should do is may I ask the the rest of the speakers to please turn on their cameras again. And I have one question, but we're at the Q&A sort of portion of this session. I'm just gonna kick things off with one question. Um, my colleague who is bearing late hours in the UK is on this panel as well. Her name is Tamsin Johnson Hughes. She has gamely offered to join and put forth questions that might be in the chat. So my question, and this really can be um, to anyone who feels comfortable and wants to answer this is um, it's always good to look at what's not working and what, what, what intentions might actually not be quite right. So I wonder if, is there anything that organizations in the scholarly community are getting wrong with how they're approaching DEI? I know that from my perspective, um, Emerald as a company undertook a lot of training, it's been happening for years, whether it's neurodiversity training, active bystander training, looking very critically at um, critical race theory, for example. But what do people think? Is there anything that we're not doing or getting wrong? I'm not sure whether, they, whether it's something we're getting wrong per se. I think um, it's such a complex, broad topic that I think one thing we could do better is try for transparency mm. and accountability. Start with an, an assessment of where you are and then be transparent in how you're going to try and change that. I, I don't think we're doing it wrong per se. I just think that we haven't given it the same level of attention before now as we give to every other metric we try to use to measure our businesses. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Sure, I will add that, um, you know, a host of institutions, corporate, nonprofit, higher ed now are hiring diversity, equity, and inclusion officers or DEI officers or chief diversity officers or however you want to term it, vice president for diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, and they're hiring these persons without staff and support mm. and without the tools to really enable to do the role, right? In reference to um, programming, initiatives, in reference to 
hiring, retention, and reference to uh, things of that nature. Uh, so uh, it's good that you're hiring these positions and you're hiring these skilled professionals, but what type of tools and resources are available for those at those institutions? I think that's a really good point. I feel like um, we all need to move away from totems and check boxes when it comes to being able to say to self-reflection, we've done this, 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 our staff look diverse, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's the next step. I think it really is a framework reconstruction that we all need to commit to. And as I said to you all during an earlier chat, like jump off the cliff, who's coming with us? Um, Dina, any thoughts on that question from your perspective? Yeah, I think it's, um, I think we do better, have done better at the, at the hiring than we have at the support once, once we get folks in. Um, and uh, I think, you know, what's, what, uh, what um, Ariel's talking, Adriel's talking about in terms of, um, you know, your diversity officers, for example, definitely resonates, but within the library, you know, we have, um, let's see, six, six, seven people of color on the library staff now, staff of 25. So we've done well in terms of recruiting, but then once they're there, you know, we value our voices, we value what they have to say, but how do you, um, how do you really position them so that they can um, be effective and not really wait a long time to um, make a difference? I think the uh, glacial pace <laughs> of the academic library is something that can be hard for our candidates to understand once they come in and join us as members of the staff. And I, I do think that Simone, Adriel, Dina, your answers to these questions might be those stumbling blocks, for example, here's this role, you have limited resources, go for it, make things happen, to being transparent about these are the actions we're going to take. And I think that they all hamper a, a genuine embedding of what everybody is, is wanting to do. Interesting. Um, why, why don't we look to any questions from attendees? Um, we have a couple of questions. So um, the first one that we have is, could you share if and um, how curricula has evolved around diverse content at your institutions? I'm not at an institution. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you know, I gave the example of um, the freshman course, which is the one that's gotten a lot of publicity and how we developed that. It's a team taught course. There are about 20 to 25 faculty who participate in that. And I think in some cases uh, we're, we have um, faculty who are experts in those areas who teach, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, I think that there are only one or two people on our faculty who are really um, have expertise in the history of Mexico City. So <laughs> everyone, so the rest of those faculty really had to stretch in order to be able to teach that material. So I think it's kind of a balance of um, what will speak to the students, what do we have expertise on, and um, what do we think we can get resources to teach about? Um, is this an area where we can stretch? So, um, you know, we used to, all the faculty who taught that course used to be uh, really well versed in the Iliad and you would see them carrying around campus because that was one of the basic texts. Now it's Invisible Man. Everybody has to be very familiar with Invisible Man. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a change. It's a big change, but I think it's um, really just, you know, stretching in a different direction from what we did traditionally. I think Reed has stepped up in other areas of the curriculum as well last year. Um, we launched a comparative race and ethnicity program, which is a multidisciplinary area, something that Reed didn't do at all in the old days. <laughs> you know, no black studies. That's why we couldn't do that. It wasn't a distinct discipline. But um, it turns out over time, uh, the faculty have, are, are readily engaging in that. So I think, again, it's a matter of having the right faculty in the room who see how this can come together. I'll see that you can see that this is a serious 
serious academic endeavor that we really need, um, that we really need to prepare our students for the world. I was just gonna add here at Seton Hill, we are have worked on our first year experience courses called Connections. So we have worked to develop more diversity, equity, inclusion uh, items tied to that course. Um, so we have emphasis on LGBTQIA, we have emphasis on uh, students with disabilities, we have emphasis on uh, socioeconomic status, we have emphasis on um, religion, religious diversity, uh, that's all embedded in the course. Uh, so we worked uh, last summer to add that content to the course. Uh, we, I was on a call this morning at 8 a.m. with the president and leaders in reference to our presidential task force. And as I noted earlier, one of the committees for that task force is tied to curricula. So the dean of the School of Business was on to say, hey, we want to develop courses tied to the significance of a racism, enslaving slaves and its, its impact on economics. Why is that not embedded in our content? So those conversations are taking place uh, and hopefully the new curricula will be rolled out uh, soon in reference to embedding diverse equity and inclusivity work into our courses through this curricula committee through the presidential task force. Got it, got it. Um, I am, we have arrived at the 45 minute mark that's allocated for this panel. Uh, what we can do though is continue Q&A for 10 more minutes, uh, but then I've been told there's a hard stop. So I'm gonna be showing a version of myself that's real mom. So we've got 10 more minutes and Tamsin, if you wouldn't mind sort of facilitating, that would be great, thank you. Sure, I'll have a look and see which other questions we have through. Uh, we have one uh, question through for um, a publisher's point of view, and this is around um, uh, publishers creating or recording any um, data around author identity in uh, title records. Uh, well, um, I think Simone unfortunately had to drop off, so I can certainly try to answer that one. And I think that is absolutely um, starting to happen. Um, again, there are real issues around privacy um, that are important and come into play. I remember probably two years ago, meeting with the, the head of a local librarian here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And the work that they were doing was exceptionally uh, scrupulous. They were not just looking at the voices within their collections and holdings, or the subject areas within. But when they were meeting with publishing houses, they were actually trying to probe to see how diverse is your organization? I mean, it just struck me as this bold and, and really a dedication to from end to end, here's what our resources look like. I thought it was just, it blew my mind. I thought it was awesome. Um, at Emerald, I think we do and are focused very much so on amplifying these voices. And over the past few years, or certainly over this year, we are just trying to realign the voices that we publish. So we published uh, business teaching cases and we you know, dedicated a whole special issue to the underrepresentation of black in business, either if they're the, you know, the protagonist of the business case or the company is black owned, you know, within business schools, there's a huge movement to get to gender and race parity within those programs. And again, if you don't see yourself in the learnings and the teachings and the curriculum, then it's just, it's just a deafer experience and quite unfair. I think. And, you know, I think I would just add to that, Erica, the, you know, from the library perspective, um, if we we're trying to diversify our collections um, at scale, it's just so critical to have that type of publisher information. So, uh, you know, it's just, it's just very difficult to do in a large library collection or medium size like we are um, without having good information that we can base our decisions on. Yeah, good point. Do we have time for another question? Sure. <laughs> um, this question is, would you say um, white people need different prep from people of color? If so, 
how um, are we addressing that particular audience? Um, and same goes for other audiences, gender, et cetera. And uh, I was just gonna say, excellent question. Excellent question. Uh, so uh, what we're doing here at our institution, uh, so uh, Seton Hill University has roughly, like I said, 2,100 students. Uh, the majority of faculty out of 105 faculty, roughly nine, um, nine are minoritized faculty or non-white faculty of the 105 uh, full-time. And out of the 2,100 students, roughly, uh, I would say 19% are students of color and roughly employees that are like 230 some employees, you can count on your hand, roughly mm. 10 are minoritized, right? So we are working to develop training and development through this freedom series that we have on a monthly basis. But what will happen is when we have our all on campus meeting, our uh, every university terms it differently, but it happens the first three days when you arrive back to campus in the spring or when you arrive back to campus in the fall, the all campus meeting, we will have training and development tied to diversity, equity, inclusion, where we will speak to uh, the different preps that Anna noted. Uh, that's when we will have those trainings and developments for all faculty, all staff that are present. Mm -hmm. So at Reed, you know, we're very small, but I think one thing that we've done that's kind of interesting is we've um, intentionally created opportunities for students to tell us um, different, different people around the college, the faculty directly, in some cases the library, other administrators on campus, what they're experiencing um, and how they experience it. And so one of the um, things that we started doing about three years ago was having students, and I can't remember the name of that program, uh, student peer or something, but, but it would be students who would volunteer to go to your class as a faculty member, sit in the class and give you some feedback about how you're presenting as a professor to your students, to a person of color, um, non-binary non person, something like that. So I think that's been a really interesting and successful program that you can replicate. Um, another thing that we've done in the library is we've had um, our Office of Diversity has sponsored social justice interns, and the library has applied for several of those and gotten them, and we actually just had a presentation, um, Zoom, unfortunately, everything's on Zoom now, but from a non-binary student who uh, spent some time talking to students about the library, talking to us, the library staff about the library, and just experiencing the library and telling us this is how the library looks to me, you know, mm -hmm. and some of the things we expected, like uh, not enough uh, non-binary restrooms, for example, um, other things we didn't really expect. And it was really um, an excellent report that got, gave us lots of things to work on. And that was just one student who got a stipend and we got so much great information from that. Yeah, I think there's, um... I think one of the speakers at this year's conference is John Palfrey. He might have already spoken. If you were lucky enough to hear from him, he's super smart. And he wrote a book um, quite a few years ago, I think with MIT Press, and I botched the title. I think it's called Brave Spaces, Safe Places. And it really explores when, when triggers happen and microaggressions and their perceived real inequities. Stretching those muscles to have safe spaces to be very brave is important. I think um, the work has to go across the racial spectrum, including white people. We might be almost there. We have um, had a question about will we be uploading any files in um, regards to diversity. So we do have um, uh, uh, links to lots of really useful um, information as well as you can access the 2020 Global Inclusivity Report. So you'll be able to access those um, after the discussion's finished. Alrighty, I think we're, we're almost there with the hard stop. 
I, I really do want to thank everybody for attending and joining us. It's um, a really important conversation and um, I hope everybody stays well and keeps their sanity through the end of 2020 and continues to fight the good fight. Um, it's got to be intentional, committed, and um, done with a lot of passion and truth talking. So thank you so much, Adriel, Dina, Simone has left. Thank you, Simone. Hamson and Susan, thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, information will be supplied. I'll figure out somehow if you want to talk to me directly, go for it. So have a good rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Waiting.